Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Bartholomew, President and Vice Chancellor, Ulster University. Secretary Blinken, Secretary Heaton Harris, Ambassador Hartley, Ambassador Pierce, Special Economic Envoy Kennedy, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great privilege for me to welcome the President of the United States of America and all of you to Ulster University and to our brand new campus in the center of Belfast today. Especially so given the context of 25 years since the signing of an agreement which has transformed Northern Ireland that signing of the Good Belfast Good Friday Agreement would not have been possible without the encouragement, engagement, and intervention of America. And so many Americans, both in Washington and here in Belfast and Northern Ireland, remains very grateful for and deeply honored by the sustained political and diplomatic support and investment of the United States in the affairs of Northern Ireland. In many ways, this building reflects the hope and promise of the agreement. 25 years ago, this was an abandoned and neglected corner of Belfast. During the Troubles, the city center was surrounded by neighborhoods which experienced violence on an almost nightly basis. At that time, buildings in Belfast were not made of glass. It was simply too risky. But look at us now. Today, this new campus, sporting around a quarter of a million of panes of glass, bring 16,000 students and staff from across Northern Ireland and indeed the world to research and study together the subjects that will shape our tomorrow. A community that used to look inward and backward can now look outward from this place and forward to the wider world. This new campus stands as a beacon for aspiration, as an engine of innovation and as a symbol of what's been achieved. Universities can only thrive if they provide an environment for inquiry, challenge, and change. Through decades of conflict, higher education was one of the few areas of life in Northern Ireland that remained genuinely open to all. And that tradition, this new building, is a meeting point for people, a shared place for communities that's also a gateway to research and learning excellence, which succeeds in widening access and facilitating participation and learning for all. Ulster University's Belfast campus is a testimony to what can happen when people have a vision and are committed to making a difference. And I know that our visitors here today exemplify that commitment to make a difference of people's lives. As we reflect on the 25th anniversary of the agreement, it's not only a moment to look back, but a moment to commit to the future. And next month, we'll launch our own 25 at 25 leadership program for 25 young people who will shape the next 25 years. And through a focus on those people in this place, working in partnership with each other and their wider communities, we will together shape this place and shape the future. So Mr. President, as you join us today, we're deeply grateful for your keen personal political interest in this place, in its peace over many decades. Your presence with us today recognizes both that commitment and the vision of so many in Ulster University too. And we're honored by your willingness to join us on this campus as we mark the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Ambassador Jane Hartley, United States Ambassador to the United Kingdom of Britain and Northern Ireland. I have a stool. I don't know if I need it. I'm the shortest in my family. Everybody else is 6'4". I don't know how this happened to me, but true. Anyway, good afternoon, everyone. It is wonderful to be back here in Northern Ireland. I came in my first official visit a few months ago when I met many of you. We spoke about the recent past and how far Northern Ireland has come 
since the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, a moment when hope and history rhymed. But we also spoke about the future, and it was clear that your ambitions are the same as ours. The hope that we can pass on more opportunity to our children, and the hope that they can pass on more opportunity to theirs. Sometimes we call that the American dream, but it's really a universal dream, a dream that's shared by families from Belfast, Northern Ireland, to Belfast, Maine. Faith in the simple dream is what gives meaning and urgency to our efforts to protect a hard-won peace. I saw that urgency at Queens and Ulster University, who are partner partnering with local businesses to create job pathways for their students. I saw that urgency in the eyes of the young leaders I met with, who were born in Northern Ireland, and though they studied or worked abroad, have decided to move back, to move back home, because they wanted to live their lives here and make their neighborhoods stronger. But I also saw communities where people are eager to work hard, but where opportunities, and especially investment, is scarce. Let's not forget, 25 years on, the Belfast Good Friday Agreement remains a stunning, stunning achievement. And today, we remember the people who risked their lives to achieve it. The people who, as President Biden said, walked brave steps so their children might have a better future. And as we celebrate the enduring success of that agreement, let us now dedicate ourselves here today to recapturing that spirit. The Windsor framework gives everyone a roadmap to move past political stalemate and toward a brighter future. The task now is for all parties to walk a few more brave steps, and here in Northern Ireland, for all parties to participate in government once again. Democracy, however messy, however imperfect, remains the best way for Northern Ireland to decide its destiny. And everyone here, including myself, believes in Northern Ireland's economic potential. We all want the next 25 years to be about prosperity, just as the last 25 years were about peace. And I personally believe they will be. The United States is the largest source of foreign direct investment in Northern Ireland. And as a former businesswoman, I can tell you, you invest in something when you believe in it. And we believe in you. We believe in your progress. We believe there is no turning back. Our burden now, a burden we welcome, is to lift everyone in Northern Ireland equally and to lift everyone up. And then to bring investment and employment with stable government, stable communities, and that's how we pass opportunity to the next generation and to the generation after that. Reflecting on the 20th anniversary of the agreement, George Mitchell said, that the real credit belonged, and I quote, to the people and political leaders of Northern Ireland who in dangerous and difficult circumstances, after entire lifetimes in conflict with one another, summoned extraordinary courage and extraordinary vision. So now it is our time our time to summon that extraordinary courage, that extraordinary vision, to get back to governing, to get back to growing. And once we do, 
I have no doubt Northern Ireland's best days lie ahead. Thank you, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, Joseph Kennedy III, United States Special Envoy to Northern Ireland for Economic Affairs. Good afternoon, everybody, and good afternoon, Northern Ireland. I am so excited and honored to be here with all of you this afternoon. You guys up there, too. <laughs> um, it has been such an extraordinary uh, 12 hours or so here. And thank you for the incredibly kind and gracious welcome. As you all know, 25 years ago, the people of the United States bet on peace. We bet on it because we bet on you. We bet on your dreams and your aspirations your hope for your kids, the future that you will write. The city, the community that you will create. Where there was pain, you saw a chance to heal. Where there were walls and wire, you saw a community. Where there was division, and skepticism, you saw hope. 25 years later, look at what you have created. Record GDP growth. University classrooms filled to the brim. Old shipyards turned into incubators for cutting edge technology. Tourism surging among ancient walls in the soft light of fertile fields. And folks, we're back too. Proud of that wager and ready to double down on a bet that has produced a peace dividend with now hundreds of US companies operating in Northern Ireland and creating tens of thousands of jobs. The number one foreign investment location for cybersecurity. Some of the biggest companies in the world have set up shop here and now some entrepreneurs with dreams to outcompete them are following. People ask me all the time, why Northern Ireland? Why invest here? Why come? Is it proximity, market access, the extraordinarily good weather? <laughs> I've had it for 12 hours, we'll take it. Folks, it's you. An American CEO told me a story when he was first visiting Belfast a few years ago, looking to expand his business. His flight landed fine, his bags did not. So he went straight to a store that night to try to get a new suit for a 7.30 a.m. breakfast meeting. He got a jacket, but the pants didn't fit. The store's owner took those pants and drove an hour that night to his mother's home, where he altered them and drove early that next morning, back, hand-delivered him to that CEO by 7 a.m. in his hotel lobby. That gentleman turned to me and said, I don't care what you're gonna say in your talk. It doesn't matter. That guy sold me on Northern Ireland better than any government official ever could. He went on and established a huge presence here. As far as I know, still wears those tailored pants. <laughs> we believe in Northern Ireland. We believe in you. We believe in your future. We believe in your kids. We believe in these amazing kids. A few weeks ago, a Harvard student from Belfast called himself a peace baby, raised on hope and the troubles 
a fading memory. I am so incredibly proud of President Biden's commitment to those peace babies, expanding their opportunity. And I'm humbled by the chance to be a part of shaping that commitment. Thank you for your incredible contributions, for your vision and your determination. And more than anything, I look forward to drawing on your energy, your ideas to ensure that we bring prosperity to every corner of Northern Ireland. It is a future to be proud of and a future worth betting on. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Orr, Chief Executive Officer of Catalyst. Distinguished guests, this is pretty cool. <laughs> I am honored to speak today about a real legacy of the Good Friday Agreement the rise of Northern Ireland's entrepreneurs. I moved to California two months after the Good Friday Agreement was signed. The years I spent there shaped me as an entrepreneur, learning from the best in what truly is the world's capital of possibility. But what changed me as a person was the civic leadership I witnessed every day by so many successful people who felt it their duty to pay it forward volunteering to help entrepreneurs for free, as they themselves had been helped. Yet, surfing nearly every day in the perfect climate, something had always bugged me. I loved home, Northern Ireland, and I could not stop thinking that the people at home were as good, if not better, than the people from anywhere else in the world. So it was my duty to try to do something to help. Because of the courage of Northern Ireland's political leaders 25 years ago, I returned home in 2007 to a place that had normalized and found a non-profit science and tech hub called Catalyst, itself established as a Good Friday Agreement project where Norman Apsley and many others shared the belief in the untapped brilliance of our people. Catalyst then agreed to become the home where we would develop the platform for Northern Ireland's most experienced and most successful people to pay it forward to help our most promising entrepreneurs. Today, more and more Northern Irish entrepreneurs and their companies are becoming world leaders in their field. The entrepreneurs do it not just for self-determination, but out of a love of Northern Ireland and a dream of creating opportunities for our people if you want to witness what fearless looks like, just talk with any of the young entrepreneurs who are here today. They put it all on the line for a brighter future every day. I know you, our political leaders today, can too. The contribution of the United States to Northern Irish entrepreneurship over the last 15 years has been profound but did not come about only due to government to government or even institution to institution relationships. It came about through the generosity of US individuals, many of whom were world leaders in their field who just wanted to pay it forward to help us. None more so than Mary Walshock of University of California, San Diego. As we look to the future, most leaders in Northern Ireland now share a common vision opportunity for all from world-leading innovation. This part of the world used to lead the world in five industries, and we will lead the world again. Only this time, we renew our pledge to pay it forward so that the opportunities created will be accessible to everyone, especially those furthest from opportunity. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, Gabriella Feenan, entrepreneur and alumni of Ulster University. Good afternoon. My name is Gabrielle Feenan, and I'm a gr recent graduate of Ulster University, and I'm from Banbridge, County Down. Following my studies, I've taken a route of entrepreneurship with support from the Ulster University Enterprise Centre and Young Enterprise NI, with my most recent venture focused on sustainable cork furniture. As we come together today to mark the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, I'd like to reflect upon its success in providing everyone here with a sense of ownership, opportunity and a new beginning. Opportunity is perhaps the most fundamental success of the Good Friday Agreement. My generation has been able to experience a country that boasts a wealth of new opportunities and has produced a generation with unswerving ambition. I am proud to come from a generation of like-minded individuals who have been bred on the what-ifs and why-nots of the world, where simply no feat is too great to be conquered. A youth which continues to strive for better, one which represents Northern Ireland on a global stage, and one which exhibits some of the world's greatest talents. Whilst it is important to recognise the successes we have seen these last 25 years, it is of equal importance to look ahead to the 25 years to come. The state-of-the-art campus that we are gathered in today is a reflection of the confidence placed in our youth, not to mention the organisations that are the foundations upon which this new generation can realise their full potential. My aspiration for the next 25 years is for us to continue to pursue that hope that was devised, but also to approach it with confidence and belief in our proven qualities and capabilities as a generation. It is now my great honour to introduce the President of the United States of America, Joe Biden. Good afternoon, everyone. What a great, please have a seat. It's a great honor to be here. I just told Gabrielle that, uh, that uh, when she's uh, uh, the leading public figure in this country and I show up, I promise she won't say, Joe, who is outside? You <laughs> say, Joe Biden, remember, just remember me, okay? Promise? All right. Uh, Chancellor Davidson, Vice Chancellor Bartholomew, thank you for hosting us today. Uh, this beautiful campus of Ulster University. I came here in 91 in this neighborhood, and you couldn't have a glass building like this here in this neighborhood, I don't think. I don't think it would have uh, stood up very well. But things are changing. Lord Mayor Black uh, and Secretary of State of Northern Ireland, Heaton Harris, thank you for the welcome to Belfast. And uh, Mr. Speaker and leaders of Northern uh, Ireland's leading five political parties. I was honored to welcome you to the White House a few weeks ago, and, uh, and it's wonderful to see all of you again today. And Ambassador Hartley, thank you for your outstanding work leading our mission to the UK. Ambassador Hartley is, uh, is an old friend and uh, the former ambassador from Great Britain to the United States, the home of that ambassador and the embassy is along the fence line of the Vice President's residence, which I lived in for eight years. And the Vice President uh, and I, beca I became friends with the, the Ambassador. And his last uh, trip uh, back home before he came back to Washington to serve out the final few months of his term, he, uh, he uh, told me he was going to bring something back for me. And so uh, I didn't know what he had in mind. But when he came back, we had him over the house. We spent some time together, he and his wife and I and my wife. And uh, he brought back a book with a, a, a photograph on the front of the book. A, a, it had been just reprinted, the book, of a somewhat stout British captain 
in his quarters with a big bulldog sitting next to him. And his name was Captain George Biden. Because he used to always kid me and saying, you know, Biden's English. You talk about the Irish, Biden's English. <laughs> and he told me that he went back and he had the Lord Admiralty. This is God's true story. Check. And my great, great 1840, I think it was 1842, could have been 1828, I can't remember, it's one of those two dates, had written the rules, the rules of mutiny for the British Navy. <laughs> and I said, well, at least that part's consistent, Reverend, <laughs> the mutiny. But um, anyway, he used to always kid me when I'd say, you know, talk about, he'd say, oh, you talk about the Irish. He said, you're English, you remember that. And then I found out, my sister and I found out the name Robinet, Robinette, my middle name is Robinette. I, uh, I thought that uh, all those years it was French. They must have been Huguenots because they came to Great Britain in the 1700s, somewhere along the way, and they're all from Nottingham. So uh, I don't know what the hell's going on here. <laughs> you, you come back, it's confusing. And anyway, Council General Nairan, Iran, and, uh, and Envoy, Special Envoy uh, Joe Kennedy. Thank you for your efforts to continue deepening and strengthening the ties between Northern Ireland and the United States. It's good to see Belfast, a city that's alive with commerce, art, and, uh, I would argue, inspiration. The dividends of peace are all around us, and this very campus is situated in an intersection where conflict and bloodshed once held a terrible sway. The idea, as I said, to have a glass building here when I was here in 91 was highly unlikely. Where barbed wire once sliced up the city, today we find cathedral, a cathedral of learning built of glass and let the shine light out in, in and out. It just has a profound impact for someone who's come back to see it. You know, it's an incredible testament to the power and the possibilities of peace. 25 years ago this week, the landmark Belfast Good Friday Agreement was signed. And it wasn't easy. I was a United States Senator at the time. And uh, I worked very closely with my good friend, George Mitchell, who will be here, I believe, in a couple days. And uh, there were no guarantees that the deal on paper would hold, no guarantees that it would be able to deliver the progress we celebrate today. It took long, hard years of work to get to this place. It took a people willing to come together in good faith and to risk boldly for the future. Leaders and a piece like John Hume and David Trimble and David Irvine and, uh, and uh, Monica McWilliams and Mary Robinson, et cetera. They were uh, all people that I got to meet back then. And it took people across, all across Northern Ireland who made the choice to work for a brighter and a shared future. At the time, it seemed so distant, some of it. It seemed so distant. First, at the ballot box, an everyday sense, the acts of seeing each other through the lens of a common humanity, which, again, when I first came here as a young senator, didn't seem like it was realistic. It took pioneering women across all communities and parties that said, enough, enough, and demanded change, as well as a seat at the negotiating table, including through the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition. And it took a determined effort of my good friend, who, someone who embodies the country's commitment to all the people, all the people in this region, Senator George Mitchell. And, uh, you know, his time serving as Special Envoy for Northern Ireland is one of the great examples in history of the right person for the right job at the right time, in my view. I think uh, sometimes, especially when the distance of history, we forget how hard-earned how astounding that piece was at the moment. It shifted the political gravity in our world. Literally, it shifted the political gravity. In 1998, it was the longest-running conflict in Europe since the end of World War II. Thousands of families had been affected by the troubles. Losses were real. The pain was personal. I need not tell many people in this audience. Every person killed in the troubles left an empty chair at that dining room table and a hole in the heart that was never filled for the ones they lost. Peace was not inevitable. We can't ever forget that. There was nothing inevitable about it. 
As George Mitchell often said, the negotiations had, quote, 700 days of failure and one day of success. 700 days of failure and one day of success. But they kept going because George and all the many others never stopped believing that success was possible. And I want all of you to know, especially the young people in the audience today, and don't jump, okay? <laughs> Oh, I didn't see that all the way up there. <laughs> As my father would say, please excuse my back. I apologize. <laughs> but all kidding aside, the American people were with you, are with you every step of the way. It's real. Those of you who have been to America know that there is a, uh, there is a large population that is invested in what happens here, that cares a great deal about what happens here. Supporting the people of Northern Ireland, protecting the peace, preserving the Belfast Good Friday Agreement is a priority for Democrats and Republicans alike in the United States. And that is unusual today because we've been very divided on our parties. This is something that brings Washington together. It brings America together. I spoke about this with Northern Ireland's political leaders as well as the Taoiseach and our St. Patrick's Day celebration at the White House. It's been a key focus for me throughout my career. I remember working as a senator to see how the United States could support and encourage, bit by bit, any moves toward peace. I got elected in 1972 as a 29-year-old kid to the United States Senate. And it was just the start of it. I mean, it seemed like it was a, a, a goal that was so far away. I remember coming here, as I said, in 91, seeing the city divided and barricaded. Then in 94, when the ceasefire was declared, it was like a, a sea change. The tide of violence began to recede, hope rolling in. In 1998, overwhelming joy. It's hard to communicate just how deeply invested your success, in your success, the people across the United States are. And those of you who've been there know it. You know it. I'm not making this up. This is real. This is — it's almost people can taste it. The family ties, the pride, and those Ulster Scots immigrants — those — those Ulster Scots immigrants who helped found and build my country, they run very deep, very deep. Men born in Ulster were among those who signed the Declaration of Independence in the United States, pledging their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor for freedom's cause. The man who printed the revolutionary document was John Dunlap. He hailed from County Tyrone. And countless, countless others established new lives of opportunity across the Atlantic, planting farms, founding communities, starting businesses, never forgetting their connection to this island. As a matter of fact, as you walk into my office in the, in the Oval Office in the United States Capitol, guess what? You know who founded and designed and built the White House? An Irishman. An Irish — no, not, not a joke. Not a joke. Passing it down generation after generation. Your history is our history. But even more important, your future is America's future. Today's Belfast is a beating heart of Northern Ireland and is poised to drive unprecedented economic opportunity and investment from communities across the U.K., across Ireland, and across the United States. The simple truth is that peace and economic opportunity go together. Peace and economic opportunity go together. In the 25 years since the Good Friday Agreement, Northern Ireland's gross domestic product has literally doubled. Doubled. And I predict to you, if things continue to move in the right direction, it will more than triple. There are Scores of major American corporations wanting to come here, wanting to invest. Many have already made homes in Northern Ireland, employing over 30,000 people. And in just the past decade, American business has generated almost $2 billion in investment in the region. $2 billion. Today, Northern Ireland is a churn of creativity, art, poetry, theater. Some of our favorite television shows and movies are filmed here, <laughs> as you know. And I understand the star of the recent Oscar-winning film and someone of Belfast barista, James Martin, is here today. James, where are you?
I got to meet James, and I got my picture taken. I'm going home and brag to my daughter. <laughs> Cruise ships packed with tourists filled Belfast port. And young people, instead of fleeing for opportunities elsewhere, can see their futures and careers for themselves that speak to unlimited possibilities here. How many of you have heard over the years, those of you old, my, closer to my age, mom, dad, there's nothing here for me. I'm going to move. I'm going to leave. I got to go. Well, it's not happening now. So it's up to us to keep this going, to keep building in the work that has been done every day for the last 25 years, to sustain the peace, unleash this incredible economic opportunity, which is just beginning. I promise you. You think I'm joking. It's just beginning. We get this, keep it going. We all know there's more we can do together. You know, there's so much energy and dynamism, especially among young people who are starting their own businesses, blazing their own trails, connecting to the global community of entrepreneurs. And young people in Northern Ireland are on the cutting edge of sectors that are going to define so much of the future. Cyber, technology, clean energy, life sciences. Here in Northern Ireland, programs like Young, young, young Entrepreneur, Young Enterprise Northern Ireland, helping thousands of young people each year gain skills and pursue the goals, their goals as entrepreneurs. That's why I asked Joe Kennedy, my new special envoy in Northern Ireland of Economic Affairs, to help supercharge that work, to bring more businesses, more investment, more opportunity here to Northern Ireland, and help realize the enormous economic potential of this region. Because I know parenthetically, when that happens here, it gives faith, faith to people around the world. If it can be done here, it can be done in my community. Not a joke. The world is changing. It's changing drastically, and it presents enormous opportunity, but also significant dangers. To that end, later this year, Joe's going to be leading the trade delegation of American companies in Northern Ireland. Now, I know the UK's departure from the European Union created complex challenges here in Northern Ireland. And I encourage the leaders of the UK and the EU to address the issues in a way that serve Northern Ireland's best interest. I deeply appreciate the personal leadership of Prime Minister Sunak and European Commissioner von der Leyen to reach an agreement. The Windsor framework addresses the practical realities of Brexit and the essentials — and it's an essential step to ensuring hard-earned peace and progress of the Good Friday agreements is that they're preserved and strengthened. You know, the negotiators listened to business leaders across the U.K. and Ireland who shared what they needed to succeed. And I believe the stability and predictability offered by this framework will encourage greater investment in Northern Ireland, significant investment in Northern Ireland. I come from a little state where — the state of Delaware and back home — has more corporations that are registered in that state than every other state in the Union combined. So I know a little bit about corporate attitudes. All the immense progress we see around us was built through conversation and compromise, discussion and debate, voting and inclusion. It's an incredible attestation to the power of democracy to deliver needs for all the people. And now I know better than most how hard democracy can be at times. We in the United States have firsthand experience how fragile even longstanding democratic institutions can be. You saw what happened on January the 6th in my country. We learn anew with every generation that democracy needs champions. When I went to college, I was a political science major and history major. We were told every generation has to fight to preserve democracies. <coughs> I didn't believe it at the time. I just thought it was automatic. We had this great democracy. What would we need to do? As a friend, I hope it's not too presumptuous for me to say that I believe democratic institutions established through the Good Friday Agreement remain critical to the future of Northern Ireland. It's a decision for you to make, not for me to make. But it seems to me they're related. An effective, devolved government that reflects the people of Northern Ireland and is accountable to them, a government that works to find ways through hard problems together, is going to draw even greater opportunity in this region. So I hope 
the assembly and the executive will soon be restored. That's a judgment for you to make, not me, but I hope it happens. Along with the institutions that facilitate North-South and East-West relations, all of which are vital pieces of the Good Friday Agreement. For in politics, no matter what divides us, if we look hard enough, there are always areas that are going to bring us together if we look hard enough. Standing for peace, rejecting political violence must be one of those things. So I want, so I want to once more recognize the way the leaders of Northern Ireland's major political parties come together in the wake of attempted murder of Detective Chief Inspector Caldwell to show that the enemies of peace will not prevail. Northern Ireland will not go back, pray God. The attack was a hard reminder that there will always be those who seek to destroy rather than rebuild. But the lesson of the Good Friday Agreement is this. In times when things seem fragile or easily broken, that is when hope and hard work are needed the most. That's when we must make our theme repair, repair. And in the Holy Easter season, this season, when all Christians celebrate renewal and life, the Good Friday Agreement showed us that there is hope for repair, even in the most awful breakages. You know, it helped people all around the world to hope for renewal and progress in their own lives. And most of all, allowed an entire generation of young people in Northern Ireland and across the UK and the Republic of Ireland to grow up in a society mended by connection, made stronger by independence, interdependence, and respect. Young people like Gabrielle, who we just heard from earlier. Her success and her opportunities have been underwritten by the Good Friday Agreement. Young people like Jordan Graham, born less than three weeks after the agreement was signed in 1998. His whole life, his whole life has unfolded under the wing of peace, which means not quite 25 years of age, He's been able to build an expertise in branding and marketing that he's used to help grow local businesses, support startups, consult for charities. Young people like Amy Clint, born in 2000, whose parents like to tell the story about how she came home from her first day of secondary school and asked, what's the difference between a Protestant and a Catholic? What's the difference between a Protestant and a Catholic? She didn't grow up thinking in sectarian divides. She grew up thinking about how she should support her beloved brother and other children with autism. Today, Amy's social enterprise has donated more than 5,000 copies of her book to schools across Northern Ireland to help children better understand autism and to learn to treat others with kindness and respect. That's the real power of the Good Friday Agreement, compassion. Compassion. It changed how this entire region sees itself. In the words of Morrissey, Belfast's first poet laureate, what's left is dark and quiet, but bookended by light, as when Dorothy opens the dull cabin door and happens out what happens outside is technicolor. What happens outside is technicolor. This place is transformed by peace, made technicolor by peace, made whole by peace. So today, I come to Belfast to pledge to all the people of Northern Ireland, the United States of America will continue to be your partner in building the future the young people of our world deserve. It matters to us, to Americans, and to me personally. It genuinely matters if you've traveled my country. So let's celebrate 25 extraordinary years by recommitting to renewal, repair, by making this exceptional peace the birthright of every child in Northern Ireland for all the days to come. That's what we should be doing. God willing, you'll be able to do it. Thank you all for listening, and may God bring you the peace we need. Thank you. <laughs>